<clears throat> it's good to be awake. I love sleeping in on these warm summer days, but some things are more important. Like working on our new Game Studiously episode off of last week's success. I overslept. Hello everyone and welcome to Game Studiously, the show where I stand in front of a camera and make video game criticism with my face because it's fun. I'm putting out an episode and you know what that means. I had an entire month of uninterrupted free time. Yeah, it turns out that running a YouTube channel while balancing school and research and other stuff is pretty hard. So, while the dream of running this YouTube channel with weekly output may be dead, for now, we can still be like family. You'll see me here two or three times a year, mostly around holidays, and we'll get to catch up and have fun. The downside is, there will be way less dessert food, but on the bright side, I promise not to lecture you about Obama's war on Christmas, like your actual family will. But hey, let's talk about video games. Thanks to the Steam Holiday Sale, I was able to pick up a game I've had my eyes on for a while. The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. After a few sittings, I finished it, and I had some thoughts that I want to share with you now. The Vanishing of Ethan Carter is a relatively new game from September 2014, made by developers The Astronauts. The game is a detective fiction, with small and, to me, compelling puzzle elements, but the game is mostly concerned with uncovering the mystery of what happened to Ethan Carter. It's at this point that I should mention that this video will not have spoilers, so please, keep watching. Consider this your no-spoiler alert. So, in The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, players step into the shoes of Paul Prospero, an extremely cliched private detective who investigates supernatural happenings. Of course, his investigation into a letter sent by Ethan Carter is his last job before hanging it up. The player begins the game on a very obvious physical path. There are rails and a great big, seemingly endless tunnel. This linearity got me to thinking not just about physical linearity, but also about narrative linearity. Naturally, I decided to incorporate some research. This is Cybertext by Dr. Espen Arseth. The book is nearly 20 years old now, but it introduced some really interesting and enduring concepts to video game scholarship. It introduces Cybertext, Arseth's perspective on text as machines, and ergodic literature, or literature of non-trivial effort. Video games would belong to this category of ergodic literature. In the first chapter, Arseth goes about his business in defining his key terms. Using the Cybertext perspective, Arseth identifies texts as machines that operate between three parts. One, a human operator. Two, a material medium, a book or a computer, for example. And three, verbal signs. But I think it might also be fair to include nonverbal signs in the third branch of his model. In any case, Arseth's notion of cybertext considers texts as machines, not metaphorically, but as mechanical devices for the production and consumption of verbal signs. This is applicable to video games, but also to more traditional literary forms, such as footnoted novels. On the way to presenting his formal model, Arseth notes that while cybertext may not, and indeed cannot be strictly narrative, they do retain to a lesser or greater extent some aspects of narrative. Arseth's notion of cybertext as machines and as game worlds for operators to get lost in clash with traditional literary critics who describe narratives metaphorically as labyrinths. The texts privileged by a cybertext perspective often have actual topological structures of textual machinery. It's almost time to dig into Ethan Carter, but one more point comes first. Arseth pursues the idea of labyrinth, citing research from Penelope Reed Dube in 1990. Basically, Notions of labyrinth stretch back to classical antiquity, hundreds of years BC. Originally, there were multiple notions of labyrinth. 
One type of labyrinth is unicursal, winding back and forth, often towards the center, but offering no forking paths. Another type is multicursal, the choice-based maze type that we're more familiar with. Before the Renaissance, both of these ideas existed harmoniously under the umbrella of a labyrinth. Post-Renaissance, however, only the notion of maze survived. Where once there was a rich ambiguity, only the notion of the impenetrable puzzle remains. And really, the remaining notion of the multicursal labyrinth is not terribly appropriate for a lot of traditional narratives. It is, however, appropriate to describe a lot of that ergodic literature. Literature of non-trivial effort, like The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. Alright, let's take our new tools and use them to dig out what's going on in this lovely game. And it is lovely. Take a look. As stated, players begin the game piloting supernatural investigator Paul Prospero on a line. But this is an adventure game, and one that is particularly concerned with narrative, which I'll explain momentarily. It's the job of the detective to get off of the beaten path and find out what's going on. Like, what's going on with this astronaut looking fella? You're not going to find out walking down the road like some doofus. As a detective, Paul Prospero's story is made by discovering Ethan's story. Laura Miller suggests this in her criticism of Broken Age for Matter's New York Review of Video Games when she makes this generalization. The best adventure games resemble detective fiction, which as a rule contains two overlapping stories, the story of what happened, and the story of how the detective finds out what happened. What's interesting in The Vanishing of Ethan Carter is how those two stories are distributed. Because we can only unearth it by discovering evidence, Ethan's story is distributed across the physical space of Red Creek Valley. A certain set of events took place leading to Ethan's disappearance, but we're presented with them as we encounter them in the physical world, rather than in chronological order. In the role of detective, the player's job is one of narrative reconstruction. By collecting evidence, the player is able to get a sense for the events of Ethan's story. Once all the evidence is collected, players are presented with narrative puzzles. Isolated story fragments are presented, and it's up to the player to rearrange them in their proper order. These puzzles translate the job of narrative reconstruction in a very straightforward fashion. Ethan's narrative can only be arranged a certain way. His story fragments only work when put into their strict order. However, our experience of those events, what might be referred to as the narrative discourse, is presented where it belongs in space rather than in time. So, how might we describe Ethan's narrative in Arseth's terms? My short answer is, I don't know. It's a static narrative that we dig up. It's rigid. It exists in fragments in the labyrinth, but it's a flat artifact once you take its pieces and rearrange them into chronological order. On the contrary, Arseth's model may have more to say about the narrative of Paul Prospero, whose story is in the hands of the player. His goal is to make sense of Ethan's disappearance. Prospero navigates an open physical space, exploring the isolated pieces of Ethan's story, in an order that the player determines. The details of Prospero's narrative are determined by the player's choices, or to use Arseth's terms, their efforted interaction with the text as machine. And Red Creek Valley is the labyrinth that players navigate. At times, it exhibits a lot of multicursal qualities. Players have the choice of straying from the beaten path and completing puzzles in their preferred order, a choice that may be dictated by an inability to find that damn crow. By making choices about the order in which to solve puzzles, and choosing which literal, physical paths to go down, players enact agency in the text. Conversely, Prospero's narrative ultimately lands at a singular conclusion, giving it the feeling of the unicursal labyrinth winding to one inevitable end. In short, the game brings together elements of both the unicursal and multicursal labyrinths. This understanding of cybertexts as game worlds or labyrinths is useful to thinking about adventure games, particularly detective fiction like The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. Ideas of narrative topology and physical space are woven together here. For example, many of the quests involve that aforementioned narrative reconstruction, but one exceptional puzzle instead demands architectural reconstruction. 
In so many ways, this game is concerned with narrative and physical space. A topological understanding of narrative is extremely helpful to understanding how the vanishing of Ethan Carter works. The game's goal of consuming you in Ethan Carter's disappearance is successful because of the type of agency that players have through Prospero. The game translates detective work by conflating physical space with narrative space, physical exploration with narrative exploration. That spatiality of story is one of the most compelling things going on in the game. Please, go play this thing and spend hours in thought about narrative structure and metaphorical mechanics in video games, if that's your sort of thing. As for me, well, that's all I've got. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you when I see you.